We are continuing in our series through Galatians, and we're going to be in chapter 2 again this morning. Next week we will um, move outside of Galatians for um, Palm Sunday and then for Good Friday and Easter, and then we'll return after Easter. Um, these next few verses, um, verses 15 through 21, are perhaps the most significant verses in the entire letter. Um, they are Paul's central thesis. Um, in short, they are the gospel that Paul proclaims. Um, we are only going to look at verses 15 and 16 this morning, um, and we will pick up the remainder after Easter. Last week, we began Paul's rebuke towards Peter. Because Peter, out of fear of the circumcision party, he went from eating with Gentile believers, fellow Gentile believers, and he withdrew from them, from their fellowship. Peter's actions strongly stating that in order for one to be saved, they had to Judaize. That is, they had to become a Jew. They needed to keep the law of Moses. Um, most of our translations, they close the quote, if you're looking at verse 14, they close the quote of Paul's discussion with Peter at the end of verse 14. But it is likely that Paul's discussion with Peter extends through the end of the chapter. Um, regardless of where your quotes end, Paul did not write this. This is not recorded for Peter. This is recorded for the believers in Galatia, and in turn, for those of us who would come after. These verses, 15 and 16, are Paul's response to the charge that justification is incomplete without observing the Mosaic law. The main idea of these two verses can be summarized as follows. How can one gain a right standing before God? Or perhaps we should make it more personal. How can you and I gain a right standing in the presence of God? Now note that I use the word gain and not earn. You and I cannot earn anything from God. But there is one. Jesus, who has made such a standing with God possible. As we lean into these two verses, I want us to notice Paul's line of argument here. First, number one, there are indeed advantages that some have by privilege of their birth and their circumstances. And two, that the gospel itself negates every single one of those Privileges, every single one of those advantages that one may have. This is true in general, it is true for you and I personally, and it is true for absolutely every human being who has ever walked this earth. If you would, um, please stand as you're able as I read from Galatians chapter 2. I'll begin at verse 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Let us pray. Father, we recognize that our standing before you is not based on anything that we can or have done, but on what your Son has done. Um, we ask that you make our hearts to know that, to believe that, to see it. Make your word a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to embarrass my family for just a moment by sharing with you 
what has endured is likely one of, if not my favorite movie series of all times. Now, if I sing the first couple notes to the theme song, some of you may be able to guess it. Da 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 da. Any anybody know? Well, we all love underdog success stories, and what makes Rocky so enduring is that in every movie, in every match. He always played the underdog. His opponents always had some major advantage over him, either more experience, more skill. Um, they were bigger, stronger. Sometimes even more money was involved. Um, they had better training facilities. Yet, with all those advantages, Rocky always remained standing at the last bell. Many of these advantages, they show up in most aspects of our lives. Some of us have advantages that others of us don't. Um, the Apostle Paul, he, he liked his sports analogies. And boxing was one of those that he shared in his letter to the Corinthians. For our message today, since some of us have just finished up upwards basketball, and some of you may be enjoying the Final Four, I thought maybe basketball could help us to get a handle on Paul's argument. In this room, we have three brothers. Um, Caleb, I, Eli, and Silas that are all good ball players. And I think it goes without saying that two of them have an advantage over the, little, the smaller one, the younger one. Hold on, Silas. I'm not going to pick on you too much, okay? If nothing else, they have at least a height advantage. Um, but they're also likely stronger and have more experience. Silas, one day, they're going to stop growing. And those advantages they now have aren't going to be advantages anymore. In fact, your youth will be the advantage, okay? Now, the point is, Caleb and Eli have done nothing to gain these particular advantages. They were born into them. They were simply a privilege of their birth, which takes us to our first point. Some, indeed, have advantages by nature of their birth and their circumstances. Look at verse 15 again. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Paul begins with the emphatic pronoun, which is why the ESV here translates it, we ourselves, referring to him and Peter and possibly the rest of the Jews who have withdrawn from fellowship with the Gentiles. Now, if Paul's statement comes across as derogatory, in one sense, it is intended to, not for the sake of putting down the Gentiles who have been alienated, but in order to utilize the Judaizers, if not even the Jews' own language. The Jews saw outsiders, those who were born outside of the covenant promises, those who did not have the covenant law, as natural-born sinners. The Jews would even accuse Jesus of eating with tax collectors and sinners. Even if one was born of Jewish descent and had some kind of physical abnormality, such as leprosy, or they were born blind, they would see such issues, as, some of them would see such issues as a product of their birth, of being born into sin. Um, even a man born blind, who Jesus had healed, the Pharisees, when questioning him, they said, you were steeped in sin from your birth, and they cast them out. Gentiles were sinners simply by virtue of their not being Jews. To be a Gentile was to be a sinner. And just in case you haven't noticed, I think every one of us in here, we're a Gentile. Now, 
Paul is not denying at all that he and Peter are sinners too. He's simply stating that he and Peter, they're not sinners in the same way that Gentiles were. Gentiles lack the saving covenant promises. Um, to use Paul's language in Romans, they did not have the adoption, the glory, the covenant, the giving of the law, the promises, the worship. The Jews, they did have the advantage. They had the advantage over the Gentiles in that they were entrusted, Paul says in Romans 3, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. Paul, he's taken this moment to highlight this ethnic privilege because, in a sense, it is a significant advantage. Their ancestry was indeed a blessing. But he'll go on to show that as tremendous of an advantage this is, it amounts to nothing before God. Just realized I'm using two microphones. Which is why... Regardless of your so-called advantage or disadvantage in life, they all fall to the ground before the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps you've had the advantage of being raised in a Christian family, in a Christian home with Christian parents, or maybe you have a Christian co-workers or a Christian neighbor down the street who talks to you about Jesus. Maybe your advantage is because we have access to the Bible, which some people do not. We have access to the gospel message. Maybe your advantage is you're not in bondage to any enslaving sins, any enslaving addictions. Maybe you've been raised with good moral character. Or maybe your advantage is you've never broke one of the big ones. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Or maybe, perhaps, your advantage is that you've been crushed and brought to the end of yourself. That you've lost everything. That you're destitute. That you're poor and needy and desperate. Or maybe even received a terminal diagnosis. We have all received a terminal diagnosis. Don't discount these as a blessing from God. A blessing to open your eyes that you might behold the truth of this message today. That you need a Savior. Why? Because your financial situation is not ultimate in your life. Your relationships with your friends or family is not ultimate. Your physical health is not ultimate. You and I are going to close our eyes one final time and stand before a holy God and give an account. What is ultimate is your standing and your relationship with Him. If in our flesh, we often like to play the comparison game. I like to look at maybe your sins a little bit bigger than mine, right? Or sometimes I tend to um, think my sins are not all that big of a deal. The Apostle Paul saw himself as the chief of sinners, which is instructive for us. The Holy Spirit, by God's grace, continues to illumine our sin little by little as we grow in our sanctification, helping us to realize that whatever advantage we may have had, it amounts to rubbish. Well, in basketball... One of the most noticeable advantages players have is their height. With the average NBA player standing six foot six or taller, and some a foot taller than that. So let's say we're going to hold a slam dunk contest. Most of us would have a severe disadvantage compared to someone like LeBron James. 
even if I practice my ball handling skills 24 7 and I exercised and strengthened my weak feeble knees unless I can put the ball in the hoop I am NOT going to score you and I we can't score before God why because the goal is not 10 feet the goal is no less than the glory of God of which we all fall short which takes us to our second point the message of the gospel negates every advantage because a right standing is not gained through works but through faith that is the central message of the gospel look at verse 16 again yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law but through faith in Jesus Christ so we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by works of the law no one will be justified First, notice how Paul unpacks this. He starts with a general statement about human beings in, in general. And then he moves on and he applies it personally to Hillman Peter. And then he applies it personally or universally, to, without exception, to everyone in the whole world. Um, let's begin with the in general. In general, a taller player has an advantage to be able to dunk. But when the goal is set in heaven, it doesn't matter how tall one is. The goal is unattainable. Before Paul brings him and Peter into the, the fray, he begins, he, with the, he appeals to what they both agree on and they know is true. He says, we know. What Paul says, he, says, he tells Peter, remember... Paul wants us to remember that he is not in disagreement regarding the gospel itself. No, what Paul and Peter disagree on is what the gospel entails for fellowship. Because Peter had withdrawn from table fellowship with Gentile believers. A person, whoever this person may be, it's simply the word for man, a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Justified is courtroom language. It is used in the court of law to pronounce someone innocent, cleared of wrongdoing, declared to be right. The question is, why can't a person be justified by their works, by the works of the law? Well, put, to put it simply, one is not standing trial for doing what is right. You stand trial for wrong doing one stands trial before God because of their sin one's law keeping doesn't cancel out one's crimes those crimes must be paid for courts of law penalize criminals for their crimes criminals do not stand before the judge to be awarded for their merits now if Steve stole ten dollars from Mark and I'm appointed judge I can't tell Mark, well, look at Steve. I mean, he's done this right, this right. I mean, he's followed everything else perfectly. I mean, he's a good guy. I mean, it's not a big deal, is it? I can't pass that off. Mark's still missing his $10. Justice hasn't been done. Furthermore, consider the glory that you and I have attempted to steal from God. Justice must be done. Judges, they don't make anyone righteous. What do judges do? They declare what actually is. They pronounce whether one is indeed righteous or not. At least they do if they're righteous judges. A good judge pronounces judgment on the wicked and 
favor for the righteous. But the issue is that God is declaring sinners to be righteous. How is that? Well, we know it's through faith in Jesus, but this should sound shocking to us because such a verdict violates the normal standards of justice. A judge who declares guilty people of, as righteous, they violate the norms of the law, the norms of justice. But Paul, he doesn't see God as violating any such standard. Why? Because Jesus took the guilty verdict along with its consequences in our place. As, as Paul mentions in Romans 8.33, no charge against God's elect shall stand because they've already been paid for. People aren't justified by their virtue of doing, but in their believing. Believers have what's called an alien righteousness, a righteousness outside themselves, because it is not based on anything the sinner has done, but solely on what God has accomplished through Christ. It's important to note that Paul, that God is not basing this verdict on what some people have called transformative righteousness, where God's declaring you righteous now, based on what he sees you are going to become in the future, even if that what you're going to become in the future is by the work of his spirit. That's not the basis of why God is declaring you righteous. No, God is crediting us righteous. He's declaring us to be righteous because of another. It's based on what Jesus has done. It's based on Jesus' righteousness. It's not a native righteousness to us. It has been granted us. Believers are, are counted righteous because of their union with Christ. Being united with Christ in both his death and his resurrection, which is where we will return uh, when we visit verses 19 and 20. Well, Paul's arguing that such is the case for believers in general. And now he's going to apply it to him and Peter personally. He says, halfway through verse 16, So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith and not by works of the law. Personally, Peter, you're being taller, you being one of the pillars, you being one of the repute in Jerusalem affords you no advantage to dunk on God's court. You and I, Peter, we have found ourselves in the same dilemma, that we couldn't be justified by our law-keeping. And thus, even we had to believe. We had to put our faith in Jesus. Though Jews, even though they could, Jew, even though they are Jews, they could only find their right standing before God through faith, not through any of their legal observances. The point Paul is arguing with Peter is that if even members of the God's covenant people who had the covenant law are only declared righteous by faith in Jesus and not through any of their legal observances, if that's what it takes for them to be reconciled, Peter, it makes absolutely no sense for you by your actions to require the Gentiles to observe the law to be justified whether that justification is their initial or continued justification. The law benefited us in no way, Peter. Don't require it of them. You see, the law, it certainly didn't stop Peter from denying Jesus after Jesus was arrested, nor could it remove Peter's stain of guilt Peter had to trust in Jesus for forgiveness, just as you and I have to trust in Jesus for forgiveness. Peter had to become a Christian, and only through faith in Jesus will Peter be acquitted on the last day. 
When we trust in Jesus, we have the same assurance Peter has, that when we stand before God's holy throne on the last day, the verdict will be not guilty. We personally, each of us in this room, we must place our faith in Christ. Justifying faith is a personal faith. I can't believe for you. I can't believe for any of my kids. You can't believe for your kids. You can't believe for anyone. Each person must trust Jesus personally, fully surrendering to Him as our only hope, basing our acceptance before God fully on what Christ has done, not on anything that you've ever accomplished. The fullness of who Jesus is and the fullness of what He has done for our salvation, that is the only thing that justifies you and me. The reason that faith does not just, or the reason faith justifies and not works of the law is that faith, it takes hold of the whole Christ. It takes care of everything, it takes hold of everything Jesus is. The only one who makes us right before God. The world it views this idea of trusting another, depending on another for our salvation. The world views this as weakness. The truth of the matter is we are weak. You and I are helpless apart from Christ. And praise God that he opened our eyes to see it. We tend to frown upon the idea of depending on another. Sure, when we're healthy, when I'm strong, when I'm seeming secure, I'll receive whatever gift you have, whatever meal you might want to offer me. But when I'm down, when I'm sick, when my pride causes me to um, be a little bit slower to receive because I don't want to appear weak, no, I'm all right. I'm okay. Don't worry about me. It'll be fine. The truth is, I don't want anyone to think I'm an invalid. But the biblical worldview is that we are all invalids. We are invalids in need of a physician who can heal us. Realize it or not, one of the primary ways you and I glorify God or dishonor God is the extent that we make known our need for Him. Psalm 50, verse 15. Call upon me, says the Lord, in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. God is glorified when you desperately fall at the feet of Jesus for forgiveness. And in the same way, you despise him when you reject that offer, when you reject his mercy, incurring even greater judgment because you have dishonored God's one and only Son. While the world looks at this as weakness, they mock and they ridicule. Our justification means that in the last day, you and I will be vindicated before all of creation, before fellow believers and our enemies alike. Our justification also has a present tense aspect to it. When you place your faith in Christ, you are declared righteous now. Now God sees you as in right standing before Him. Now there's no longer any condemnation. Now God's wrath is removed. Now God is for you. Now all things work together for your good. And now that you have been declared righteous before God, it is expected that you and I would fellowship with every other person who has received that same right standing before God. That we'd eat at the same table. That we would not withdraw from Gentiles who have believed. As we saw last week, to deny such a fellowship is to deny the gospel by our actions, by our very lives. Let me ask, have you 
personally, because that's Paul's point, have you personally received this justification? Trust Jesus. What is true in general, and it's true for you and me personally, is also true universally. It is true for every single human being without exception. With the basketball hoop set in heaven, the goal, nothing less than the glory of God, even players with the greatest advantages come up short. Perhaps you've made a half-court shot before, or a full-court buzzer beater. In God's court, all your skill and performance are weighed as nothing before the cross. If anyone could be saved by the law, surely it was a natural-born Jew like Peter. But even he had to believe because at the end of verse 6, because no one, by works of the law, no one will be justified. The word Paul uses that the ESV translates as no one, it's actually the word for flesh. Paul, in one sense, is likely playing on the circumcision party's idea that one had to remove a small piece of flesh in order to make the rest of the flesh right before God. It also, the flesh also emphasizes our weakness, our fallenness. Three times in a single verse, Paul has stressed the need to believe in Jesus to be justified. And three times, generally, personally, and now universally, Paul stresses that the law is helpless to make you or me right with God. The problem, however, is not the law itself. In Romans 7, Paul makes clear that the law is holy and righteous and good. The reason the law can't justify is not because something's wrong with the law, but because you and me are lawless. The problem with the law is our lawlessness. And even if we could keep the law externally, we break it internally. To bring this point home, I'm going to boast for just a moment. So please bear with my foolishness. I was working on a lady's house this week. Six month widowed. Um, and as I was wrapping up, I noticed a piece of soffit laying in the gutters. And I could have easily just informed her about it and told her to call someone who does that kind of work. My company does not do soffit and fascia repair. Instead, partly because my ladder was already off my truck, I grabbed two nails, I climbed up, I reinserted the soffit, and I tacked the fascia that held it back into place. Now, it took me less than five minutes to do this. The lady never knew about it. I didn't inform her. I didn't mention it. I just did it. Now that simple deed, and yes, it was a good work, just like many of you have done countless good works that you could come up here and share with the rest of us. That good work earns me nothing before God. Why? Because it is merely my duty as an image bearer. It is expected of image bearers to be like the one they image. In fact, for me to admit, omit my responsibility to do good to my neighbor, which countless times I have neglected because, well, it didn't line up with my agenda. Um, because my agenda is not always what God's agenda is. Just like the countless times you have neglected doing the good you should have for your neighbor is because it didn't line up with your agenda. Yours and God's agenda didn't reconcile. For me to admit my responsibility of doing good for my neighbor actually places me on the stand in trial before the judge. 
for failing to reflect the image, the goodness of our Maker who causes the rain to fall and the sun to rise on both the just and the unjust. It doesn't matter whether it is a friend, an acquaintance, or even your enemy. Listen to Exodus 23, verses 4 and 5. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going down, I mean, going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue both him and the donkey. This is the law of Moses. This is the works of the law. And the Jews and Peter were concerned with ceremonial observances, such as circumcision and eating particular foods and the cleanliness laws. You know, one of the reasons why we read Leviticus 19 was to remind us of our duty to love our neighbor as ourself. We don't clean all the grapes off our vine. We leave them so that others who do not have a vineyard can have grapes. Remember, our goal is nothing less than the glory of God. You were hand-fashioned to image God, to reflect His glory throughout all of creation. The ultimate charge which every single image bearer will stand trial for is not whether they were circumcised, ate the right foods, fellowship with the right people. No. What everyone will stand trial for won't even be for our high-handed sins, such as murder, theft, adultery, lying. Each of us, each image bearer, will ultimately stand trial for their failure to live out their Creator's purpose in their life to glorify God. We stand under judgment for deeming it to be a small thing to glorify our Creator. That's the judgment. And the world finds us offensive. Indeed, the gospel is offensive because it's humbling to the nth degree. It negates our every advantage, everything that sets you apart, that makes you special from another. It negates our every ability to make ourselves right before God. You see, if the primary sin is our exalting ourselves as autonomous, what could be more despised and humbling than the gospel? I wasn't made to glorify Josh Louder. And you weren't made to glorify you. We were made to glorify God. To know Him. Love Him. Trust Him. Delight in Him. Make Him known. Treasure Him. Exalt Him. Worship Him. Serve Him. To find our satisfaction in Him. To depend on Him. To cleave to Him. To believe Him. But never to be Him. Each of us, in the end, will serve our created purpose to glorify God. The question is whether such will be your greatest joy and your deepest delight or your absolute worst nightmare. The only hope for anyone, regardless of ethnicity, Jew or Gentile, regardless of your gender, your age, your social status, your economic status, who your friends are, who your friends aren't. The only hope any of us have of not being declared guilty in the last day before righteous judges, holy tribunal, is to fall on the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. You might ask, well, what about Jesus? Was he justified by works of the law? 
He certainly upheld the law perfectly. But Jesus didn't earn his father's favor by doing the law. Jesus never sinned, so he wasn't condemned for his own sin or for any failure to glorify his father, any failure to reflect the image of his father perfectly. No, it was for our sin that Jesus was condemned. Jesus stood before the tribunal, before the court, and was declared guilty in our place, paying the penalty you and I deserve. And Jesus was raised, not because he kept the law, but because of the same God-glorifying disposition you and I are called to, that of faith. Jesus entrusted himself. He had faith. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Jesus lived out in his flesh what we are all called to do. Listen to this from Hebrews 5, verse 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications. Sometimes we think of that referring to prayers and supplications for us. No, it refers to more than that. Jesus is pleading for himself. Listen to this. Jesus offered up prayers and supplica supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence, his honoring his father as holy, glorifying his father perfectly. Because Jesus trusted his father completely, both fully as a man and as the divine son, without a moment of that faith wavering, even to the point of death on a cross, his father did judge him justly and raised him from the dead, vindicating him before all rulers and authorities. Jesus glorified his father by his faith, the obedience of faith, the same faith you and I are called to. You will not be justified by your works, only through faith and help. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us your son. That you have done what we could not do. We could not keep the law. Our flesh is weak. And we have sought to exalt ourselves instead of exalting you. We have not done the good we are called to. Oh, how many times we have passed by our neighbor on the left or on the right. But not you. You stopped. You nursed us. You cared for our wounds by being wounded in our place. It's by your wounds that we are healed. And now you sit in heaven interceding on our behalf that there is therefore now no condemnation. That no charge can be brought against us because you have already died and paid the price. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Write this word on our hearts. Remind us every time we seek to earn favor. Remind us every time we seek to make someone else feel like they need 
to earn our favor or yours. Point us to the cross where your love was poured out. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.